very interesting to see how many people are here and uh, to ask the reason why you're here. Obviously, it's a special reason because maybe you've got a problem with remembering things or maybe you're um, having patients complaining about not remembering things. It's actually the third major cause now of people going to consult their medical practitioner is after pain and tiredness comes loss of memory. And so it's a growing problem. And the more we hear about it, and the more we begin to realize that the destiny may be that when we get into our 70s and 80s, we may lose our memory, and some may go into more serious pathological problems. But the good news is always at the end of the day, the most important information. Um, so I'm gonna tell you that now in case you have to go off early or you've forgotten what you're here for. <laughs> and uh, that's, statistically, if you make it to 90, you will not get Alzheimer's. No 90-year-old apparently has got Alzheimer's disease. So the good thing is, is you pass through those 70s and 80s and maybe earlier in the 60s, that's when you tend to get the degeneration come in for whatever reason. But if you make it into a nonagenarian, you're less likely to get any brain damage. And most nonagenarians are actually very compass mentors. So that's good news really, isn't it? So all we've got to do is make it to 90. So when I heard that memory loss is the third largest reason people consult healthcare practitioners, I thought, well, let's put a seminar together about memory. And we'll start with memory, and then we'll gradually work towards the more pathological side. And we'll look at the major current research and findings both clinically and neuroscience-wise of where the issues are coming from. So there's a lot of new information, uh, a lot of really good, exciting stuff. So we are called the seminar from memory loss to dementia. Now, in 2012, when I suggested the name Epigenetics as a company, a new company, um, nobody had really ever heard of the name and had difficulty even pronouncing it. So I went back to the guys and said, Epigenetics, that's a good name for a company. And they said, Epi, Epi, Epi what? And then after that, everybody started hearing the word on the radio, and all of a sudden, it became a buzzword. Recently, I looked in PubMed, and it now has 386,000 published articles on epigenetics. 386,000. So we formed a new company called Epigenetics Limited, and the phone number is 01380 800 105. Okay. So today, what we're going to be looking at is a number of different topics, and we're going to look at what memory is in the short term and the long term, we're going to look at the physiology of learning and possibly where it's stored, which neurotransmitters function at the nerve connections, the neurotransmitters that are involved specifically with memory and memory recall, the ATP pumps that pump sodium and calcium out of the cells, the importance of fatty acid in neuronal cell membranes, which is what Jill's going to be talking to you about, transneural degeneration, which means when the nerve starts to deteriorate, because of lack of stimulation, or deafferentation as it's called, infections, allergies, toxicity and deficiencies. We're going to look at energy production because everything about the brain is about energy. Reactive oxygen species or oxidation. And we're going to learn a lot later on about mitochondrial DNA and the role that plays with its specific, specific structure. We'll learn a little bit about genetics that can affect brain and memory through APOE4 apolipoprotein E4 allele, a little bit about methylation, and particularly in relationship to high ho homocysteine, uh, hypoxia, which is lack of oxygen or decreased oxygen, the role of the gut and the biome, or getting the right type of flora back into the gut, and toxins and aromatic fatty acids that are produced in the gut that can get into the system, into the brain, and decrease its function, particularly propionic acid. And finally, we'll look at how to examine a patient. Now, we're going to be using a number of markers which are available. The major one, when you look at somebody with a memory loss, is whether they're building up fragments of protein, of amyloid protein. So the major marker will be amyloid beta protein fragments. And these are specific parts of the protein which have been shown to accumulate in pathological problems, but particularly Alzheimer's disease, with the fragments of the amino acid strings of 1 to 42. Now, when it comes to energy, as far as the neurons are concerned, and pumping out sodium and potassium, we need to look at ATP as a measurement. 
we need to look at a substance called DNA polymerase, which is the enzyme that does the repair to not only the DNA in the nucleus, but mainly the DNA in the mitochondria. So DNA polymerase is a very, very important enzyme. CoQ10, because it carries the electron in the first part of the electron transport chain from complex 1, 2 to 3. We'll be looking at complex 3 itself, the cytochrome C reductase. And then cytochrome C, which is like CoQ10, carries the electrons from complex 3 to 4. And then we'll be looking at complex 4, called cytochrome oxidase. We'll be looking at the fatty acid membrane on the inner membrane of the mitochondria, which is the rich source of cardiolipin, a very specific phospholipid. We'll be looking at the gases that are given off when we have reactive oxidant damage there, and particularly caused by low oxygen or hypoxia, of how we produce carbon monoxide and cyanide, particularly in bad hypoxia. And when all our membranes go rancid, how malondialdehyde is the marker that builds up to indicate we've got lipid peroxidation. To check for homocysteine, we'll be using homocysteine. To check for APOE4, we'll be looking at APOE4, allele, and different probiotics. When we come to looking at hypoxia, we'll obviously use oxygen, hemoglobin, and the markers through the porphyrin pathway to produce heme. So this is the hypoxic markers that we'll be using, which you're probably familiar with from the seminars we did last year on phrenocardiography. So let's uh, start with what memory is. And we know that memory is the process in which information is encoded, in other words, information going in, how it's stored and then retrieved. And encoding allows information from the outside world to reach the body through the five senses in the form of a physical or biochemical effect. The loss of memory is described as forgetfulness, uh, and in serious cases, it's called amnesia. And there are three main stages in the formation and the retrieval of memory. So we have the encoding or registration. This is the receiving, processing, and combining of received information. Number two is the storage or the creation of the permanent record, and number three is the recall. So we just remember it as one, two, three. So we've got the input, the storage, and then the recall. So when you listen to me, you're listening with your ears, so information's going through the ears. You're also looking at the AV here, and possibly me and other people around, so you're getting a visual input as well. But you could have an input through touch. This is a very important input. You could have an input through smell and through taste. Well, ideally, the best input is, of course, with using, utilizing all five. We then got to write the hard disk, if you like, of where that memory is. In other words, we have to make neuronal connections in order to be able to retrieve that information. We, this is called neuronetting, or making holographic uh, networks there. And then we've got to be able to retrieve it. And by far the most common problem, as we'll see, is being able to recall. Most people have learnt, most people receive the information because we know under hypnosis that they can recall every single detail of what they see and hear and smell and taste and touch. So you'll even remember al almost everybody in this room, but you won't take it in consciously. The brain will filter out a lot of that, but in hypnosis you can actually recall most of the, the events if the information went in the first place. So if you have a problem with your eye or your hearing, then you may not get all that information in. But the good news is most of us, it is in there, but we just have problems retrieving it. So the physiology of learning depends upon putting input through those five senses. So what makes people learn is, as we'll see, is the intensity and the duration and the frequency of the input. Okay? <coughs> so what I want you to do <coughs> is to think of the most memorable event in living British history. Got it? Okay. Which undoubtedly is this. <laughs> After 60 years, we won Wimbledon. Okay. And I think most of you were there in your lounge watching this. Very few people didn't see this. And, and the emotion when he won was phenomenal, wasn't it? So there was the input, the, the cheering. It was, it was such a memorable event. <coughs> Difficult to remember that it's 2013, you know, it's coming up for two years ago. So we could put anywhere, th any event in there, any incidents. And the thing is, if you remember that, how, why is it you can remember that? 
but you can't remember where you put your keys. <laughs> okay. So, because you don't emphasize the where you put the keys, you just put them down, don't you? And uh, whereas this was a memorable event because of the intensity of it. We waited 60 years for this. And how many Wimbledons and international tennises have we seen him fail at the end when British tennis players fail? And then the moment came when he did. And it, so the intensity was tremendous. All right? And the duration of it, of course, because it was a long match, four hours or something, plus, of course, that information went on for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. So the repetition was there. So you had the duration, the intensity, and the repetition. So any event needs all of those. And this is how fundamentally we put information in. So if you only fleetingly mention something, you don't really learn it. But if you repeat it and repeat it and then increase the intensity of however the information goes in, whether it's visual intensity or whether it's uh, auditory or whether it's feel, smell, taste and touch. So that's the basis of the learning. Now, in addition to the inputs, we need to get the, the brain cells to talk to each other and they do this chemically, so although the, uh, the information goes from one end of the nerve to the other electrically, it's one nerve talks to another through chemicals, and these chemicals are called neurotransmitters. So you need to have the appropriate synthesis or manufacture at the terminal end of the nerve of the neurotransmitter. So in other words, if you've got your, your electrical uh, connections, your nerves, but they're not making contact, they're not made producing the neurotransmitter, one nerve can't relay that information onto the next one. So if you've got a deficiency of the vital liquids or the chemicals at the end of there, uh, then the nerves can't talk to each other. So if we divide the learning now into input, storage, and output, input information is through the five senses. And all five senses operate by excitatory neurotransmitters. So excitatory, as we'll come to learn, means that the synapse transmits a particular neurotransmitter called glutamate and in the spinal cord aspartate and it opens up channels in the next nerve and in the case of excitatory neurotransmitters there's sodium and calcium so the next nerve allows one ion of sodium to enter and one ion of calcium to enter but in the case of an excitatory it allows multiple entries so there's a lot of positives if you like go into the next one and those positive charges have to be pumped out and to pump those out, you need ATP, or energy. Okay. So an excitatory neurotransmitter, or an excitatory neuron, uses more energy uh, than an ordinary stimulatory or an inhibitory neurotransmitter, neuronal, neuronal circuit. All right? So the learning process, it takes a lot of energy in the process. So when we learn, we have to have a lot of energy. If we're tired, and you know that uh, probably only too well, at the end of the day, you're tired in yourself, you can't learn very difficult to learn when you're tired. So the input is all through excitatory neurotransmitter networks, and these in the brain are mainly glutamate, otherwise known as glutamic acid. So the input through the five senses is excitatory. We store our memories by making neuronal connections, by stimulating dendritic growth to make more synapses, to build up bigger neural nets. And the stimulation to this is by dopamine. So dopamine is the neurotransmitter that helps us store our information. This is why the buzz um, drugs for super learning like Ritalin allow because they're stimulants of dopamine. So if you want to super learn, you take Ritalin on the black market usually, and then you have this ability to be able to learn vast amounts of information in a short period of time, which is great for taking your final examinations apparently. But long-term information has indicated your brain actually shrinks in the process. So it's the price you pay. Now, the most important part is the output is by recalling our memories from the holographic uh, database through the hippocampus and other limbic parts. And this is mediated primarily by acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter or the chemical of memory recall. So now we've got three neurotransmitters. So we've got glutamate, dopamine, and acetylcholine. Now, glutamate works by opening up, as I said, sodium and calcium channels, because it's excitatory. And it allows multiple entries of those ions. Acetylcholine and dopamine allow only one ion of sodium to enter the cell each time. So every time a neurotransmitter um, uh, attaches to the next neuron, 
and the ion channel opens up, it allows just one ion of sodium to enter, and that has to be pumped out. And the doorway or the channel then shuts. So everyone going in has to be pumped out. But in the case of glutamate or the excitatory ones, we get multiple entries. Learning difficulties must therefore be due to, number one, insufficient sensory input. In other words, we've got problems in our visual input, our auditory, our taste, touch, and smell or insufficient glutamate synthesis. In other words, are we able to manufacture or synthesize in the nerve, in the nerve itself, enough glutamate or glutamic acid? Okay. Number two, the learning difficulty may be that we're not writing the disc properly. So insufficient dendritic connection. Okay, so we could have problems with not having the right connections being made or insufficient dopamine being synthesized. So when we've got potentially low dopamine being synthesized in the terminal end of the nerve, we won't be able to write the hard disk. And number three, the recall, will be due to insufficient cortical hippocampus connections. This could be lost because of degeneration, or it could be lost because of an accident, or a cerebral vascular accident, like a stroke or traumatic head injury. So we could actually physically lose the connections or decrease them, or an insufficient synthesis of acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter. Okay? So those are the three possibilities. So you've now learned excitatory is the way it goes in, dopamine is the way we store it, okay, and acetylcholine is the way we retrieve it. So a deficiency in the excitatory neurotransmitter can be challenged, we found, through the beginning and ending points of the meridians. Every meridian is associated with different neuronal ne networks and it's not as easy as what we thought many years ago, it was generally accepted, was a nerve, was a nerve which had secreted acetylcholine on the end. So it became an acetylcholinergic nerve. Now we know that on the nerve end, there are dendrites, or like roots, and these have multiple, sometimes hundreds of dendrites at the end. And some of those will be acetylcholine, but some of them will be dopamine, and some will be glutamate, and some will be other neurotransmitters. So in other words, every nerve can transmit and talk to almost every other nerve in the body. It's a phenomenal holographic network. So we know that the glutamate network, we call it rather than specific glutamate, glutamate nerves, can be challenged at triple warmer 23. So triple warmer 23 is the end point of the triple warmer meridian and is associated with the excitatory neurotransmitters of glutamate and aspartate. So just pop your fingers on there. This is on the junction of the zygomatic bone to the frontal bone. So it's about 10 o'clock. So if you just run your finger on the orbit, you'll feel there's a little suture there, which is between the zygomatic bone and the frontal bone. So it's about 10 o'clock on one side, 2 o'clock on the other, if you were looking at it. That's the point, that's triple warm 23. The deficiency of the neurotransmitter is associated with a low dopamine is a conception vessel 24. Now this is just on the border between the lip and the skin in the midline, on the lower lip. Okay? That's conception vessel 24. Obviously, memory problems are a lack, as I said, of the neurotransmitter or stimulation, and therefore they're associated with the Yang meridians, which are associated with deficiencies of neurotransmitters. And the last deficiency, possibly, is of acetylcholine, which is at gallbladder 1. And gallbladder 1 is right on the lateral part of the orbit, but it's just on the inside of the orbit. So if you pop your fingers on there at 9 o'clock or 3 o'clock, and then just roll your fingers into the orbit slightly, and just rub them up and down, and you'll feel something about the size of a flax seed. It's very, very small. But when a meridian is active, in that sense, these points swell. And they can swell quite up to the size of a lentil, or bigger. And the more chronic a problem is, the greater the swelling and the harder it is um, to treat. So that's the gallbladder. So those are the three meridian points associated with the three neurotransmitters which are associated with the memory input, storage, and output. So here we've got the points on the face there. So learning is a process um, taken overall that can be stopped. And many of us, or many people, do stop. Uh, they go to um, school, or they go on to college or to university, and they really have to learn their stuff in order to be able to pass the exams, and then they close their books and that's it. And our profession as an osteopath was uh, no better than most for this. And we used to 
um, really get quite um, naffed at the College of Osteopathy, British School of Osteopathy, um, because we reckoned it out that only 50% of osteopaths had ever done uh, any postgraduate training in their life, which was amazing. But in those days of the early applied kinesiology seminars, I think, Anne, you were on those because you were my co-tutor, a director, and uh, we had groups of dentists in those days that used to do all the temporal mandibular work with us and learn from that. And they used to tell us only 5% of dentists had ever done a postgraduate course in their life. And that was more what, uh, music to our ears, really, because we weren't so bad then. Okay? Now, of course, we've all got to do compulsory uh, ongoing professional development, which is great, which is good. Um, so we all have to keep reasonably up to date, anyway. And the world is, of course, full of information. And there's so much to learn out there, isn't it? And it's so fascinating. And we'll see that the key to all this is the more you learn, the easier it is to learn. Okay? The less you learn, the harder it is. So the more you stimulate the brain, the easier it is and the greater quantities you can learn. So learning can be stopped. <laughs> um, you don't have to stop, of course, but it can be stopped. It can be slowed down. And equally, of course, it can be speeded up. So as I said, the more you learn, the better you are. All that is necessary to speed up learning is to stimulate the five senses, vision, hearing, smell, taste, and touch, with increasing frequency, intensity, and duration. You get the idea of it now. And the first person to really put that into words was Glenn Doman. Uh, Doman and Glenn Doman were the first people to develop cross-crawl stimulation for brain-damaged children. And I was fortunate to meet Glenn quite a few times at his Institute of Human Potential in Philadelphia. He recently passed on, but he was really the epitome I was of everybody's grandfather, how he should be. You can imagine almost sitting on Glenn's knee, because he was such a lovely guy, wonderful with the children. So the sensory neurons of the five pathways are all mediated by excitatory neurotransmitters, as I said. Here's a, an example of neurotransmitters that are excitatory. And the reason for this is that they have two carboxyl groups. Uh, a C double O um, H is called a carboxyl group that you get at the end, the terminal end of an amino acid. But in the case of aspartate or aspartic acid or glutamic acid, you see we've got two carboxyl groups. And that's what opens the ion channel in the mem cell membrane of the nerve and leaves the door open. So if you imagine the door, like at the back there, is being left open, that would mean that lots and lots of people could come into this seminar, whether they've been being invited in or not. Okay? But if that door was shut and each time it opened, only one person came in, you could control that or regulate that. So in the case of an excitatory neurotransmitter ion channel, we have to have guards on the side, or voltage channel regulators, they're called. And we'll come on to that, because the two voltage channel regulators are zinc on one side and magnesium on the other. So if you're deficient in magnesium or zinc or both, like some people are, you're more likely to allow multiple depolarization to occur of an excitatory neuron, which means you get hyperactivity going on. So people start to see things and they, they, the vision goes all peculiar, they start to hear noises, they're sensitive to, to, uh, to sounds, they become hypersensitive to touch and to taste, etc. So neurotransmitters are very important, but the excitatory ones are really special to look after, that we want to regulate them. We don't want them over or under. So we've got vision, remember, hearing. Uh, this is uh, a picture of Jill's eye. This is a picture of Jill's ear. This is a picture of Jill's mouth. These are the tastes which are associated with the neurotransmitters. So as you know, with taste, we've got sweet on the tip of the tongue here. Um, interestingly, although we've got sweet on the tip, you'll see we've also got salt right the way underlying that. So you've got sweet and you've got salt, but the tip is associated with the sweet bit there. And people always think, oh, that's the sensation of the tongue. If you stick a pin in there, you'll also have pain, okay? And you'll also be able to squeeze it and you'll have touch. Uh, and coarse touch and so on and so on. So there's actually 13 different sensations from the tip of the tongue alone. And these all go into the tractus solitarius in the base of the brain stem. So it's a wonderful neurological input. Now down the side we've got salt and then sour and bitter at the back. And they've more recently discovered Yamani, which is that salty taste of monosodium glutamate, is in the middle there. 
So now we've got a number of different sensations there, and these are mediated by aspartic acid and glutamic acid. Aspartic acid, as you know, when it's mixed with phenylalanine, gives the sweet taste, doesn't it, of aspartame. Glutamic acid with, uh, with uh, monosodium glutamate is more of a salty one. And then we've got two other neurotransmitters because these have actually got two or three carboxyl groups, arginosuccinate, which is a substance made in the urea cycle, and cystathione, which is made en route to making homocysteine, is also an excitatory neurotransmitter. Uh, this is Jill's nose, uh, and this is her touching and treating patients. So the excitatory um, uh, receptor, the NMDA glutamate sensitive receptor activation, and the induction of long-term potentiation, in other words, the long-term putting of information in, are thought to be necessary for the learning process. So in other words, we have to have the right receptors to receive the glutamate to activate the excitatory neurons, and we have to do it often enough, or regularly enough, or the intensity, to create long-term uh, memory lines called long-term potentiations. Glutamate receptors are also thought to play critical terms in uh, the short term as well as the long term. So here we see it uh, at the terminal end of a neuron. And as we'll learn, the neurotransmitter itself is actually made in the terminal end of the nerve. This is not to do with substances that we eat. You know, some of those substances that we eat, like monosodium glutamate, may drift through the brain bi blood brain barrier and get into the synapse and attach to the next nerve. They're not manufactured here. All the neurotransmitters like dopamine, glutamate, etc., where one nerve talks to another, is actually manufactured in the terminal end of the nerve. So here we've got glutamate being manufactured, crossing the synapse and allowing sodium to enter into the next cell, and calcium potentially, and magnesium out. So when the depolarization has occurred, in other words, this nerve has fired, sodium will then enter, calcium enters, and magnesium is, pumped, is, is shunted out during depolarization. That means that this nerve now has one or multiple molecules of sodium and potassium. Now this will be negatively charged okay, initially, and when a positive goes into it, it becomes depolarized, in other words, it loses its negativity. Okay? So in order to recharge, it has to pump that sodium and that calcium out, and the pumping is done by pumps, and the pumps use energy, or ATP. Okay, so the ATP has to be made on the spot in the nerve. And the place where we make the ATP is in an area called the mitochondria, which we're going to study in more detail than you probably ever imagined. Now, the mitochondria are the powerhouses that make ATP, which then loses its charge and makes ADP, or converts to ADP. So ADP, adenosine diphosphate, is charged up, if you like, to ATP, adenosine triphosphate, then immediately loses that energy and converts back to ADP. So it's like a battery, a rechargeable battery, that charges and discharges, charges, discharges. And the difference is it does this hundreds or thousands of times a second. Okay, so it's not doing it and holding the storage. There's no such thing as stamina. You know, when you think about it, this, we don't store energy at all. If you turn off the ATP mitochondria in the body, you will live for precisely four seconds. And that will be it. There's no reserve of energy at all. We make energy. We make it, use it, make it, use it. We imagine there's a mitochondria in every cell in the body. Okay? In some cells, there are a few. In muscles, there are 2,000 mitochondria per cell. In the neuron, there are up to 5,000. 5,000 powerhouses in your neurons okay? because they have to do more work than anywhere else. And as we'll see, the neuron uses more energy and therefore it needs more oxygen than anywhere else in the body. It uses 20% of all the oxygen that we take in through here is used by the brain. Okay? So the first place we see drops in energy and drops in oxygen levels is in the brain and the ability to think and recall memory. Okay? So here's glutamate or glutamic acid, and we can see it's made from the amino acid glutamine, and to make it we need potassium, we need magnesium. Or we can make it from the Krebs cycle, from alpha-ketoglutarate, and to do this we need ammonia and vitamin B3. 
NADPH, the coenzyme of vitamin B3. So those are the nutrients there. So let's now challenge the input. So challenge each of the five senses, right to left, and then left to right. Now this is really one of the things we developed um, about a year or so ago with children who had difficulty learning. And what the problem was that most of the children with difficulty learning didn't have inability to see, but they couldn't put the information in that they did see. Reading was very difficult, and in the same way, hearing was very difficult. So what I need is a body. Okay, so could I have somebody, anybody at all, who wants to be a model here? Okay, there you go. I'm sure, Anna, you haven't got any problems, but we'll, we'll see. Right. So we're looking at this in isolation. This is not how we would examine a patient from the beginning, because when I go through the protocol of examining a patient this afternoon, we would obviously do some other preliminary work first of all. But what we're going to do is we're just simply going to bend her knee up here and use a strong indicator muscle, which we seem to have got nice and strong. And what she's going to do is to put her fingers, one on the right eye, with your eyes closed. Okay, so one, and I want you to put the finger tip where you would see in the eye. So in other words, don't put it on the side of the eye. Put it right in the middle where the pupil would be, and now on the left one. So we're doing a two-handed challenge. So what we're doing is we're asking your left eye, how do you like your right eye? So in relationship to the right eye, which you're touching, in other words, your object beam, how do you like the reference to the left? And the answer is, no problem, she doesn't go weak. So now take your fingers off, and now do left to right. So you notice what I'm doing, I'm comparing the right to the left, <coughs> and the left to the right. And no reactions at all. Well done. Excellent. Okay. Now what we're going to do, is we're going to stick the fingers in the ears. So you can do the same one, finger in, in the actual ear, uh, in the right and to the left. So you can keep your eyes open this time. Okay, and then take them out, and then do them around the other way. So a person who has problems here, you may actually have to place the fingers for them. Okay, because they won't really understand what you do. All right? Now, these are the big three, I call these. Now, this is the one that what you've got to do is to tickle yourself on the right, all right? Now, I won't do it because girls particularly are very ticklish, so off you go, tickle yourself on the right, because they say you can't tickle yourself, don't they? Which is not true, as you, as you saw, <laughs> okay. Right, so we, what we're doing is a sensation of input or touch on the right, and then take them away, and now do the left, no, a bit more than that. Put some stimulation in. That's it. Good. Stop. And now the right. So we're doing left to right. Okay, Paul. Good. So that's excellent. So those are the big three. But they're the rarest three to come up, strangely enough. They don't come up as much as the next ones. Okay, now, this is the one that the little boys like most of all, is we're going to put the middle finger, okay, on the right, in the right nostril. So the middle finger, this one, up on the skin of the right nostril. Okay, and now the left one. So we're going to compare smell on the right to the left, take them out, and then left to right. This is why we have four fingers, okay? Now we're going to do the fourth finger, all right, for that reason, is because you're going to put it on the right side of the tongue to the left side of the tongue, okay? And then we're going to do it around the other way. We're going to do the left tongue to the right tongue. And hey, presto, look at this, okay? Something has left a bad taste in Anna's mouth. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes these people, they could be adults, they could still be children, um, were fussy eaters. Were you a fussy eater? No, you weren't a fussy eater. But you probably can't remember. You know, sometimes people don't remember. They say, no, I was, I was fine. But you ask their mum or dad, and they say, no, they wouldn't eat this, they wouldn't eat that. Do you have any food allergies now? Mm, not, really. not really. Usually people with this have food sensitivities, we'll see. There's something which, what they did is they don't like certain foods, and often their mum forced them to eat it. So they built up neuronal networks of dislike for certain tastes and things. So just do that one again. So fourth finger on the, no, do it on the right first, to the left, okay? And then we'll do left to right. Okay. Okay. So could we have a mirror on torch? Get a mirror on torch. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna treat this and the way we treat this is to maintain the therapy localizations or the reference point. And what we're going to do is we're going to put one minute of Miron light, which is the light that comes out of the 
a torch uh, with the bottom end of a Miran bottle in it. Okay? And if you've never seen this, it's a beautiful violet light which is just right on the edge of the visible spectrum. In fact, it's almost beyond that because when you look at the Miran bottle uh, or glass, it looks black. But when you put a light behind it, you get this beautiful purple violet color coming out from behind. But only if you use natural light or a halogen or krypton bulb. If you use LED, you get a blue light come out through it, okay? which weakens almost everybody, like LED light. So the LED is not a true light. It's not a broad spectrum. It doesn't have the full colors of the rainbow. How are we doing? Have we done a minute yet? So by the time you've wafted on about this to the patient, the minute is usually up. Yeah, OK. So you can probably see that. Maybe Gary can catch that on the camera, that beautiful purple light. If not, we'll do it there. So you can see the lovely, lovely color there. OK. So it's really right on the edge. It's not quick. It's probably partially into ultraviolet, but it's certainly about 380 nanometers, which is about the extreme of what we can see with the, the, with the human eye. So, right. So that's done, yeah? Now, what do we do now? We go through them again. So starting with the first finger, eyes right to left, and then left to right, good. And then the same finger you use in the ear, and right ear to the left ear, left ear to the right ear. Absolutely brilliant, okay. Tickle yourself on the right, tickle yourself on the left. You've got to hold on, because most people tend to take your hands off after you tickled, okay. And then tickle yourself on the left, tickle yourself on the right, okay. And then up the nose with the uh, middle one, isn't it? On the right to the left, and then the left to the right. Okay. Now we still got to do the tongue again because it could be around the other way. So fourth finger, tongue to the right, to the left. No, and then left to the right. Okay. <coughs> Why? Because some people actually show the same sensory input, but on the other side. Okay. So you, once you do it on the left to the right, it's not unusual for a person then to have the right to the left. It's not unusual to have a person, let's say, right to left visually and left to right with the ears. So you can imagine how difficult learning is for these people. You know, the information going in is just being scrambled all over the network there. Very, very difficult. So this is a really, really simple, easy technique to do with anybody who has learning difficulties or learning recall problems, okay? So we've got to actually look at the five senses and Leaving aside pathological problems of somebody not being able to see the blackboard or read the book, most people can, but they don't digest that information. It doesn't go in equally to the left and the right brain and the particular locations where it needs it. Okay, so there we've got the, the five points in, and there's the tickling one. Okay, so remember, you could use other sensations with the touch. Your touch itself is not usually strong enough. You've actually got to put a bit more in that. Rather than sticking pins in left to right and right to left, tickling is a much nicer sensation. 